So uh, we're going to continue uh, along and get more details here. Um, what we're going to do is um, look at the specific uh, photosystems and how electrons flow between them uh, and how and where the ATP and NADPH are made. So that's our goals right now. So the chloroplast, right? right this is inside the cytoplasm of the plant cell or the photosynthetic cell. Um, it has an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and then there's the thylakoid membrane. And that's what we're focused on right now. This membrane represents the, the, inner, the thylakoid membrane, the innermost of the three membranes. The space out here would be the stroma. That's represented over this area. And then inside the innermost space is called the thylakoid space. So that's where we are. So this is going to be our photosystem 2, which we call uh, p 6AD, that's the reaction center uh, for photosystem 2. And so we said what's going to happen is that electrons uh, from that uh, reaction center chlorophyll will be excited. Now I'm going to draw them going up into the stroma. They're not going into the stroma, but the idea is that they're going to, they're coming up here, they're, they're excited, excited electrons, and they're going to be taken by the primary electron acceptor. The primary electron acceptor is going to pass them on to a carrier here that's embedded in the thylakoid space. Uh, it is sometimes referred to just as um, PQ, or because its name is plastoquinone. Plastoquinone here is then going to just simply pass the electrons on to another molecule. This molecule here is like one of the pumps, so the electrons. Electrons get passed on. This is electrons being passed. Uh, it's called the B6F, I'll write on the side here, B6F complex. And it is uh, an active transport pump. And so what it's going to do is it's going to pump protons, or hydrogen ions, into the thylakoid space. So there's pumping of hydrogen ions. That's happening here. Just like in the mitochondria, the energy of the electrons powers the active transport pump. The electrons, though, will continue to be passed along. So now they're going to go to another carrier, uh, referred to as PC. So that one here is called plastocyanin. PC, plastocyanin, that's an N. Uh, PQ, plastoquinone, that's the first one. In the middle is this B6F complex here, which is the active transport pump. So you've got part of this photosystem. Photosystem 2 is an antenna array. It's collecting light from the sun. The light is exciting electrons. The electrons are getting excited, dropping back down to lower energy states, then passing on the energy to the reaction center, P680. It gathers up that energy, its electrons get excited, but then they're taken away from it. It becomes oxidized. They get passed on to plastoquinone, who gives the electrons to this active transport pump, B6F. It uses the energy to pump protons into the thylakoid space. The electrons continue to go on to plastocyanin, and jo the job of plastocyanin is to give those electrons to the reaction center called P700. All right, so this is now photosystem one over here. Now, same sort of thing. Every photosystem has sort of certain things happening. It, they gather their own energy as well, so the pigments in here can be excited um, by light uh, energy. They channel the energy along to P700. The P700 electrons get pushed up to high energy state. The electrons go to the primary electron acceptor. It takes them away. Now, and in this case, it's going to give them to a molecule called, uh, referred to as FD um, here, which is ferrodoxin. Okay. So the electrons are going to go to ferrodoxin. Ferrodoxin interacts with uh, an enzyme. Here. This enzyme is an NADH. 
P reductase enzyme. And so what it's going to do is take the electrons from ferrodoxin and give them to uh, NADP plus to make NADPH. Okay, so NADPH, that's one of our major products of the light dependent reactions. So these reactions are dependent upon light energy exciting electrons. They harness that energy of the light and pass it on as excited electrons. The electrons flow through an electron transport chain. So this can be considered a type of electron transport chain here, going from plastoquinone to B6F to plastocyanin to P700. And as they flow along, protons get pumped into the space and they get stored there. So that's the equivalent of stored energy, right? Stored energy. And that's still to come to be used. We have, we'll get back to that. Now the electrons flow to another, rea another um, reaction center, chlorophyll, here, uh, of another photosystem. And then the excited electrons here go to ferrodoxin and, and leave and, and are stored with this electron carrier, NADPH. And that's, that's the basic flow, this sort of linear flow of electrons going from P680 to NADPH. So they're kind of flowing through all this and eventually ending up here. So a couple things to address. First off, as P700 loses electrons, it get, regains the lost electrons. So it becomes oxidized and then reduced. Oxidized and reduced, it loses electrons, gains electrons, loses electrons, gains electrons um, because they're being fed to it. P680 loses electrons, but it's not connected to this process. It's not, not a cycle uh, in, in this particular sense. So where do the electrons come from? If you remember, we said water was necessary for photosynthesis. And that's because there's going to be an enzyme here associated with photosystem 2. It's not associated with photosystem 1. It's associated only with photosystem 2. And what it's going to do is split water molecules right, into oxygens, and that's going to give off oxygen gas. Okay, So remember what we said. So plants, sometimes people think about Plants taking up carbon dioxide and giving off oxygen. That a lot of our oxygen in the atmosphere comes from photosynthesis. This is, this is sort of where it comes from. Okay, It comes from the uh, enzyme here splitting water specifically so that it could get the electrons from these hydrogen ions, from hydrogens. So the hydrogen is going to be split into protons, it's hydrogen ions, and electrons. And then those electrons are going to go to replace the ones lost by P680. So essentially, the, as P680 becomes oxidized and loses electrons, they'll be replaced by electrons from water molecules, specifically from the hydrogens of the water molecules. And as the hydrogens are stripped apart, all that's left is the oxygen, and then the oxygen is given off by the plant uh, to the atmosphere. That, that's the idea here. So now we have this process here. Photosystem 2, photosystem 1. We have the parts of the photosystem, the antenna array, the reaction center, primary electron acceptor. The difference here really between the two are that at the reaction center absorbs light at slightly different um, wavelength, 680 nanometers versus 700. They're both chlorophyll A molecules. So both P680 and P700 um, and P700 are both chlorophyll A molecules, but slightly different. Uh, part of that is their interacting with slightly different proteins that are the, the primary electron acceptors, who then are either going to give the electrons to ferrodoxin or they're going to give the electrons to plastoquinones. That makes them different. Right. These leave and then go get stored here to be used elsewhere. These go along through the electron transport chain and end up at the other reaction center, P700. The other thing to talk about here is uh, two things come out of the light dependent reactions. There are two major products. So the light dependent reactions make NADPH and ATP in equal amounts. So we see that the NADPH, the electrons flow through. 
What about ATP? So we don't really see that here. It's not part of this, at least not directly. Okay. But indirectly, what we have also embedded in the thylakoid is an FO, F1, ATPase. So if you remember from studying the mitochondria, the FO is the transmembrane protein. It will allow diffusion of hydrogen ions from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So there are hydrogen ions here in the stroma, but they're in a lower concentration than they are in the thylakoid space because these active transport pumps are pumping the hydrogen ions into the space so they accumulate in a higher concentration and it's a smaller volume so also adding it to be a higher concentration overall so there's going to be diffusion of the hydrogen ions out or back into that space as they do that there is the f1 which is a protein in uh, an enzyme that's an atp ace so what it's going to be able to do is take a dp and free phosphates and make ATP. So the ATP will be made by using the energy of diffusion that's coming from these hydrogen ions. This is the same thing that happens in the mitochondria um, with the electron transport chain coupled with the FOF1 ATPase that's in the mitochondria. So how our mitochondria make ATP, it's essentially the same thing. So they both do this. So in terms of similarities between mitochondria and chloroplasts, mitochondria have electron transport chain. There's active transport pumps that pump protons. Chloroplasts have an electron transport chain. There's a pump that pumps protons. They're, they're different ones, there's different numbers of them, but in general, they do some, some very similar things. Both of them have FOF1 ATP aces. Both of them have a process where they can use diffusion to make ATP. And so now we can see, so ATP will be made and NADPH will be made. That's the, essentially the light-dependent reactions. Now, before I get rid of this and move on to, to the, the next part, to the light-independent reactions, we'll talk about a few final things that can kind of link everything up. This process makes these. Why? What for? What, what, why does it make them? What do we do with them? We said photosynthesis, we had that equation, like water, carbon dioxide equals sugars, and so on. So what we have here is uh, light energy... All right, and we have the water, but so far what we have are, are ATP and NADPH. Um, we don't don't have anything else. Um, so where's the carbon dioxide part of it? Well, that that comes later. Uh, what about uh, the sugar molecules? We said those aren't really going to be made here. We'll talk a little bit about how the precursors to those are made in the next process. But essentially, to uh, fix the carbon dioxide, to remove it from the atmosphere, and then start to join them together to start to build the sugar precursors, it's gonna require energy. These are gonna supply the energy, both of them will supply energy for what we call the light independent reactions. Now some people, or to, oh, a long time ago, so if someone refers to this as the dark reactions, that's very outdated. Um, the reactions we're going to talk about next can happen in the dark. That's why they're often called dark reactions. But by calling them the dark reactions, people misunderstand or misinterpret and think that they happen only in the dark. Like these reactions happen in the light and that's it. And then the others happen in the dark, and that's it. And that's not true. These only happen in the light. They're completely dependent upon light. The light independent reactions depend upon ATP and NADPH, which means if ATP and NADPH are available when it's light, the light independent reactions will happen. They'll happen when it's light out, as long as there's ATP and NADPH. When the light goes away, as long as the cell still has enough ATP and NADPH, they will continue in the dark. They don't require light. They happen with or without light, but they just need these molecules for energy. So the purpose of the light dependent reactions is to take the light energy, relay it to excited electrons, 
who are going to be both stored in NADPH molecules and used along their path to generate ATP molecules. So now we have these two molecules generated. What we're going to find in the light independent reactions, while they need ATP and NADPH, they need them in different amounts. Okay, so they're going to need more ATP than NADPH. What that means is that if these are made in equal amounts, if you get like for every pair of electrons that flow through here, you get one NADPH and one ATP, and let's say you have 10 of them, well, when these 10 um, ATP, sorry, when the 10 ATP are used, you're not going to use all 10 NADPH. You're going to use only a smaller number. We'll get into the details of it later. Um, and so you have extra NADPH. So you make 10 more, and then again, you use all the ATP, but then you'll have a couple extra NADPHs. And the same thing will happen over and over again until the NADPH start to build up in high concentrations, and they're actually not being used, or all of them are not being used. So before we, we get rid of this, um, there's something called cyclic electron flow. And that is when these electrons are passed to ferrodoxin, ferrodoxin actually has sort of a choice right, in a way. Ferrodoxin can pass the electrons on to the NADP reductase. But if NADPH is in a high concentration, it will actually come back and bind to this enzyme and shut it down. So the enzyme is turned off. And then the ferrodoxin will be like, what do I do with these electrons? Someone just gave me some high energy electrons and I'm supposed to give them to this enzyme, but now the enzyme's shut down. What should I do? It can then feed the electrons back to the B6F complex. What does the B6F complex do? It pumps protons. So it uses high energy electrons, right? to pump protons. And then those protons can be used to make ATP. So essentially what happens is this process can and will flow electrons through to the point where they go to NADPH. And the cell will use those NADPH. But if it starts to produce too much NADPH and it's not using all of it, it can then shut down that enzyme through feedback inhibition, knocks it, knocks it out. And the ferrodoxin then has an alternate pathway, a secondary pathway, right? Which is a cyclic pathway when you think about it, right? Because these electrons here are now going in a, a loop, right? The electrons are, are going from B6F to plastocyanin to P700, getting excited, going to the electron uh, acceptor, ferrodoxin, then back to B6F, then to then to the plastocyanin, P700, ferrodoxin, back to B6F. And they actually can just, this, these electrons could be like looped around. Eventually when the NADPH uh, becomes depleted, it's actually used again by these reactions, then the cell is like, oh, I, I need more NADPH. So it'll draw this away. And then the enzyme works again and the electrons go to this. So ferrodoxin really has two alternate branches. Its primary job is to give it to this enzyme, but if it's shut down, it has a secondary job to shuttle them back to the electron transport chain. So that's going to come into play as we talk about the light independent reactions next. All right. So um, make sure you can kind of sketch this out on your own. Um, know the terminology, know the basic flow. There are a couple of good drawings and pictures as well in, uh, in PowerPoints um, that you have available to you and other um, images online.